this is Bob Scully and welcome to another edition of The World Show, the Energy Series. Will the three E's ever meet? Energy, environment and economics. Sometimes we think not, but then you listen to Michael Moore and you see things differently. Not that Michael Moore, not the filmmaker. This man is an erudite academic and a specialist in the field. He's the former chief economist for the Renewable Energy Laboratory in Colorado, a former commissioner on the California Energy Commission, and now a senior fellow at the Institute for Sustainable Energy at the University of Calgary. And he brings to his subject not only passion and knowledge, but also a sense of relativity. Here's Michael Moore. Professor Moore, oil is, is very much on our minds. It's in the paper every day. I'd wager you can't pick up a major newspaper on any given day without seeing the word and the topic somewhere. And I'll just throw at you some, uh, I was trying to put it together this morning. There's certainly three families of ideas out there. Um, there's um, still a pessimistic um, family of people saying peak oil, $200 a barrel, rising prices, limited supply, doomsayers. Then. There's the uh, glad handers at the other end who are saying, oh, no, no, fracking and supplies being found all the time. We had no idea we had this much oil and gas in the planet and forget it. We've got it for hundreds of years. And, and then finally, there's a, there's a, 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 a third bunch which isn't really uh, concerned with, with price or supply, but, uh, but with uh, the environment. Uh, and they, of course, push hard. And, um, and, and uh, there's, there's also a subset of people saying the oil market is changing. We cannot believe it to be what it is normally. You're an oil and energy economist. Can you make sense of all that? Well, I can make a little bit of sense out of it. I, first, I, I guess, to put it in context, I'd say two things. We are oil-based in part because of the transportation system that we've built, which runs on oil derivatives. And we built a lot of roads, we built a lot of cars and trucks that utilize that fuel. So in a sense, we've made ourselves dependent on a source that is liquid, mm -hmm. very high density in terms of energy, uh, and convenient. It's cheap, appears uh, just about everywhere in the world in some form, and we can get access to it and we know how to do that. As far as the disappearing oil or the peak oil argument, I take myself back to Malthus who uh, badly misestimated what was going to happen with population because he forgot about technology. Mm -hmm. He forgot that technology tends to give us access to resources in ways that we never had before. And it keeps increasing, uh, at least as I have so far and likely to in the near future. Same thing for oil. We're not likely to run out of oil anytime, let's say, in the next couple hundred years. We might, if we used it all, cook ourselves off the planet with the, <laughs> with the, the waste heat, but we won't run out of it. We might run out of, of $80 oil and have to have more expensive mm -hmm. oil if, if we continue to use that. But in the meantime, as far as hydrocarbons go, it's starting to be displaced by a much cheaper fuel, a hydrocarbon fuel, and that's natural gas. Yeah. So the world's changing. Even as we stand on the shore watching things go by, the world is changing and oil, although important, uh, is less and less relevant to uh, what's likely to be the energy future. But can we imagine, I mean, you, we have an oil-powered transportation system, as you said, we can imagine a partly gas-powered transportation system, but not, not nearly as convenient. I, I, I can't see millions of automobiles running on gas. You know, oh, which... that's not a likely future. Uh, and, and in fact, if I, uh, just to go back on what I was just saying, the idea of, of oil diminishing to zero is, is uh, just not likely in the future. Uh, we'll probably wean ourselves off of oil at some point 50 years out into the future. The idea of an electric car or an electric transportation future is about that time. Uh, so we've got some converging curves that we've got to manage. And the environmental point that you brought up is important, mm -hmm. and we've got ways to control that. We've got rules, and we've also got technology that can diminish that carbon footprint. We just have to have the will to use it. And um, is it possible, I've begun to read also in, in this forest of opinions, some people are saying, well, there's some oil we'll never get to. Not only are we not gonna run out, we're not gonna want it all, because indeed technology will have given us cleaner, better ways in the meantime. Um, and therefore supply of oil is, is just out of the question as a, as a problem. 
Well, it's, it's an interesting point because if I look at some of the very early oil discoveries, at least in North America, Southern California and the Permian region in Texas, we left a lot of oil in the ground simply because we couldn't get at it. Mm -hmm. And you can argue that we left, say, 70 to 75 percent of it in the ground. And part of what we're doing now is going back and recovering that oil using newer techniques for drilling or acquisition or cleaning up the oil. And it turns out that it's pretty light, pretty sweet, meaning that it has pretty low sulfur in it. Uh, and so it looks a lot like the oil from the boom that started all this, and it's relatively cheap. So we're not likely to have to go for all of the really deep, really uh, heavy and hard to get at oil, which is not a great thing to hear for Canadian oil, which tends to be heavier and, and harder to process. In, in other words, the oil sands oil, uh, which some people love to hate, that one is vulnerable even on price considerations is what you're saying, on cost considerations. It, it probably is. Uh, we built uh, specialized refineries in the 70s and 80s of the last century down in the mid-continent in the U.S. specifically to handle heavy oil. Right now, a lot of the Canadian oil, which has that characteristic can't get to those mm -hmm. refineries, but the oil that can is coming out of North Dakota or it's coming out of Texas. And so the refineries are taking, for them, suboptimal oil, but it's turning out to be cheaper. And at the same time, a curious phenomenon happening in North America, at least, people are driving less. So yeah, yeah. something we never thought would happen in, in this term yeah, right. is happening. We're seeing demand start to fall. And the transportation of oil, I mean, you've alluded to that, that the oil, for instance, out of the Canadian oil sands can't get to its natural markets. Um, the transportation of it uh, has given rise to some spectacular access. The, the, the sort of the fallback position to pipelines has been trains so far, by and large. Uh, all you can do trucks and other other things, but um, but there's been an accident in Quebec with 47 dead. Uh, there was something down in Arkansas, I believe, um, uh, in North Dakota itself. Um, is that a worry? It it absolutely is a worry. And just to put it in context, we move oil or we move toxic goods typically by pipeline, or we have in the past. As the supply of those has increased, we've had to start increasing capacity, but we're now finding that every time you want to build a new oil pipeline or you want to build a new transmission wire for electricity, mm -hmm. you're bumping up against a neighborhood that grew up against it over time. And people don't like to have things, they don't like to know what's lying underneath them in the ground anyway. Uh, and uh, even worse, they, they don't like to see it when it fails. A lot of those systems, uh, take the wires for instance, have been in operation for about 70 years plus. Uh, you heat a metal and cool it and heat it and cool it often enough and it starts to get brittle. Mm -hmm. So they can't carry as much electricity as they did. In the pipelines, a lot of those are 45 and 50 years old. The metals tend to corrode. If we don't police them or inspect them often enough, we've got a problem in terms of being able to rely on them safely. So. A lot of deferred maintenance and a lot of deferred investment in new modern systems uh, is coming to, to roost with us. Now let's assume that investment is made, the proper investment and maintenance are done. Is one of them better, trains versus pipelines? Well, on, strictly on the basis of, of the accident on a per unit or let's call it a per gallon basis, the pipelines appear to be a safer alternative today. And we could imagine that part of that is because the, there's simply more units moving. You've got more separate groups of cars moving mm -hmm. in any one time than simply pushing a fluid through the pipeline. So if we maintain the pipelines securely enough over time, they're likely to be a safer on a per unit basis uh, way to transfer goods. When rails uh, comes into use, it's typically because they can't get access to pipelines or there's some constraint and then they are opportunistic, the uh, same as any other commerce mm -hmm. point, start to fill the gap and when they do, they do or have been doing what a lot of businesses do, they run close to the edge and that means that we've now got another problem that comes in and that's our uh, let's say uh, laissez-faire or tendency to want to mm -hmm. encourage commerce yeah. without over-regulating it and we, we may have 
fallen too far behind that curve. And another commodity, it's funny, it's a, it, it, in the same breath that people will mention, it's a, practically the same vocabulary. We have hundreds of years of oil left and we don't realize it. We also have hundreds of years of coal left uh, when, and we, we don't realize it, we don't think about it. And coal pollutes uh, as much as oil, if not more, but it's not on anybody's radar. Nobody hates coal. Uh, nobody's, uh, well, some people do, but it's, it's really not. You, 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 the, my, my initial test, if you were to open the paper, you wouldn't find the word coal very much. Oil is all over the papers. Why? You don't find the word coal, and in part, I think it's uh, because the rules and the economics of using coal have started to help to phase it out. It's simply fading into the background as far as a, a power generation fuel. So we tend to use coal mostly for electricity generation. And now, if and it used to be the cheapest thing that mm -hmm. you could possibly get uh, in, in countries like China or even in South Korea. It, it still is yeah. uh, if, if you're going to exclude uh, nuclear power. But uh, at the end of the day today, if you can mine natural gas and put it in what amounts to the engine off of a jet plane, a, a gas turbine, you can generate electricity that is uh, able to change rapidly, uh, to match demand. It's very cheap and it's half as dirty as coal. So it's coal in a sense as a power generation fuel, especially in North America, just quietly fading into the background. And the new market for coal is likely to be in, in countries like China, where the environmental controls are just a little bit more lax than what we have here. And where they have supply. The Chinese have coal, and it makes economic sense, p purely in economic terms. They don't have to import it, and they have a huge pollution problem. Uh, but I'm told they're as addicted to coal as we might be to oil. It's very hard to change that whole industrial system. That would seem to be true, given the number of new power plants that they are building uh, that are devoted just to coal then that, that's probably right. The problem in their case is that the level of coal, the quality of it is lower than, than what we might have here. Mm -hmm. But the relevant piece for them is that that's a commitment, long-term commitment. We tend to build power plants with an expected lifespan of 30 years, 35 years. Coal plants were built with a slightly longer expected lifespan, say 45 years, but it looks as though many of them are going to last for 90 and that means that you're going to be running pretty old, pretty inefficient technology for a long time. And because of the nature of, of energy generation, it's very capital intensive, doesn't move around. Mm -hmm. Once you of build course, it, it yeah. stays where you built it. And you don't replace it very often. Too expensive, uh, too cumbersome. So we tend to lump along with old technology far longer than some of the innovative alternatives uh, would seem to dictate. And you, had, you want to amortize it because it's capital intensive and you put it in one spot, you're, you're going to squeeze every possible yield from it, logically. Well, it's true. And, and in, the, in the developed nations, like in North America, uh, they, they have a trick that uh, basically they'll write the, the value of the, of the facility down to zero sell it to another company, starts the amortization, the, uh, <laughs> uh, the, the, uh, It's like the oil depletion, uh, Right, and then you start all over again and uh, deplete it down to zero, it, sell it again. So it, in some cases, the nuclear plants, for instance, have been written down on the books to zero up to three times. Same plant, yeah. but, yeah. uh, And that reminds me of restaurants, too. Restaurants go bankrupt and a new restaurant comes in, uses the kitchen exactly. where and the so all the capital yeah. commitments exactly yeah. the same thing once but, you invest in it but it's really want. because it's so expensive to build it's not just a, a game it's uh, it, the fact is that there's a lot of capital that goes into these well things. and not yeah. just the plant because if you imagine that every the energy system is a pretty complex web of interwoven pieces there's power generation there's wire transfer there's a distribution network out to the final users uh, the piece that's generally missing is waste control, mm -hmm. and we don't account for that very well. But this system, once it's built, is very hard to unravel. Now, we've alluded, you've brought up uh, nuclear two or three times, and uh, that, too, used to be in the papers a lot. It's coming back. Uh, there was the Pandora's Promise, uh, the documentary on CNN, saying environmentalists themselves, in some cases, are coming over to nuclear, saying it's, it's going to take too long to, to, to clean up the air otherwise let's do this and after all we only had 56 deaths with three major accidents in the entire industry over you know over its existence etc cetera, etc cetera. What, what do you think of that 
Well, I, I, you're reminding me of a, a talk that I gave a couple of weeks ago where I was uh, looking back to Jack Lemmon uh, having the uh, foresight to produce a movie, The China Syndrome, mm. uh, within a week of the uh, breakdown at Three Mile Island, and yeah. the public never forgot it. Mm -hmm. It's the cleanest form of, of energy that we've got. Uh, it, it tends to, to not ramp up and down to match demand very well, but it's, it's a good backdrop for the power system. And I, my suspicion is that long term, when we really get a handle on how much heat we can tolerate from carbon waste, the attraction of nuclear as a power source is going to come back and be very, very powerful. We have to overcome a public perception, not necessarily knowledge, but a perception that it's either evil or that it's going to fall in the hands of terrorists and they're going to produce bombs as a result of it. Mm -hmm. And once we do that and once we, once we retool the perception of the value of it and the fact that we can safely control it, then I suspect we'll finally see some greenfield sites again. But the length of time it takes to get a permit and build a nuclear plant from ground to uh, generate electrons, probably about 17 years. That's, that's a long time to keep the dream yeah. alive yeah. Uh, when you can build a gas turbine in three years. So we tend to take the easy way out. It, I think it's gonna take dedicated political leadership, uh, I, a financing industry that is is aware of the potential and has got some some uh, longevity associated with it to get back to nuclear but it's 50 years out it's in our future and but it's a big pendulum because I was uh, I remember reading France and Germany for instance they they went whole hog for it you know, I think 50 percent of French uh, electricity at some point was generated by nuclear now in Germany at least they're decommissioning um, they're going the other way uh, they're shutting them all down. Um, so it's a big pendulum. It's, uh, it, it is still, a, and people do confuse it with bombs. Uh, the word nuclear, of course, uh, brings up the idea of weapons. Um, that's going to be hard to undo. It is very hard to undo. And when you get a government such as Germany or such as the reaction, the, the pushback from uh, Japan as far as mm. their own nuclear fleet, when you get that happening, it's, it's hard to turn that around when they are saying to the public, look, we can simply replace all this. We'll build solar, we'll build wind, mm. uh, or uh, we'll have uh, methane gas generation from waste dumps. And uh, at the end of the day, uh, it's a it's a misguided dream. We can't we can't build enough renewable energy in order to match the kind of need that we have today. And so you you take people and, and give them a, a false hope uh, that they can change, such as they had in France or such as they've been uh, espousing in Germany. Mm -hmm. And there's a, a bigger day of reckoning uh, coming when they have to go back in and as France is doing today and saying, well, maybe we made a mistake. Maybe we better think about relicensing the nuclear facilities and buy another 20 years. Japan's probably going to do that with half of their fleet now because they're, they've shut everything down, all 54 yeah. plants, and they're going to get back to uh, natural gas fired generation. That won't last forever. So they, there's probably a resurgence and a lot more safety coming. And uh, wind and solar were, 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 were happening upon all of them in, 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 in order. Um, I've not met a single um, uh, commentator in this series to tell me, yeah, wind and solar. Uh, everybody says, oh, wind and solar. It's just, it's, it's wonderful if it works and is economical, but nobody can demonstrate it. And there's true believers out there, but when you scratch a bit, it's always government subsidies. It's always, it's always kind of a boondoggle. Uh, uh, just a, uh, are we going to give up on all that at some point? Or? I don't think we're going to give up on it. It's too firmly fixed in the public mind to, to uh, do that. Uh, for instance, we did a survey of, of Canadian households to find out how literate Canadians were uh, about uh, energy issues. Sandia Labs in the U.S. is doing the same kind of survey to find out what the public knows about energy in, in general. And we find that uh, even though they don't always have it available to them, most people want to believe that their power comes from hydroelectric, mm -hmm. green, or from wind power. Uh, and so the perception is that it's out there, I can get it, and it's cost effective, when in fact the wind doesn't blow all the time. <laughs> it's blowing mostly at night when we are not yeah. using that power. 
Uh, solar is only available during hours of, of sunlight, and they're very expensive. Uh, so when we imagine using them in conjunction with each other, we can imagine 35% maybe of the, the total electric load being covered by that. But after that, at least in today's world, if we don't use nuclear, we're going to be backing it up with some sort of hydrocarbon-like natural gas. And the word green is so sacred, and of course it should be, uh, the, you know, it's, it's respect for our, the environment that, that, the, that the good Lord gave us, and we want it to be clean, um, but you have pointed out, um, with, with a good sense of humor actually, um, for instance, you analyzed green jobs, how they were tallying so-called green jobs, and you said, if, the, if I take that accountant who's in a green job, because he's working in a solar plant doing the bills, and I move him across the street to the oil company, now it's a dirty job. He's doing the same job. So there's a kind of theology around this green stuff um, that maybe isn't helping their cause at all. Well, it, it, it's, not, it's not helping us get to the place we'd like to get, which is a more benign impact on the environment. Uh, but it, it does have a, a way of, of assuaging people's feelings and making them feel better about, mm -hmm. well, that company's doing green work or they're providing green products and so therefore I can rest easy and, and I don't have to make any other, any other choices uh, in my life. So it's, it's hard when the perception doesn't match the reality and people want to take advantage of the icon, as it were, mm -hmm. uh, or the word. Uh, instead of the the action and, and the actual deed. And uh, we're, we're, since we're sort of cataloging them one after the other, um, solar and wind have been shown to be stubbornly uneconomical. Hydro, however, harnessing rivers, that is economical or has been in many cases, certainly in, in this country. Um, but is it just out of favor? Um, it's not, uh, it can't compete with natural gas and therefore is going to sort of diminish? Or? Well, I suspect that what, what you're seeing most of is that hydroelectric power was a phenomenon that got started when land was either cheap or, or free, uh, or where you could displace people that, that couldn't vote or uh, couldn't fight back. Mm -hmm. So we built a lot of hydroelectric facilities. We don't build them uh, that way anymore. A couple of, of uh, uh, examples that run counter Black to that Alps, up yeah. in, <laughs> in, in eastern Canada right now. But there's not a lot of new, very large-scale hydro facilities being built. More to the point, though, the idea of low-head hydro, that is uh, low-slope hydroelectric electric facilities that are keyed to the communities that live near them, is pretty attractive. And when we imagine that you can use that, you can switch it on, switch it off very fast, uh, that if we combine that with some of the other tools that we have to manage the electric load, now we've really got uh, a weapon. One example is uh, hot water heaters. Mm -hmm. uh, you don't have to be uh, heating your hot water in a home all the time, but we do. We run a charge to it. That energy that's not needed necessarily by you or by your house could be available to the system operator on one to two seconds basis. Oh. And so if they had a little uh, radio frequency device that they could shut your hot water heater down, the electric ones, and basically reuse that electricity because it wasn't going to you, you'd never know it. Your hot water heater wouldn't know it for a couple of days. No, of course not. And that power, rather than waiting two, min two minutes, ten minutes to get uh, a gas generator spool up and use it for something that was happening, peak demand in a city, suddenly you could steal it back just by re-switching it. So when we start to combine techniques, we really have a power to make a more dynamic system. Like those, also I'm just thinking as you're talking of these river, so-called river turbines. Yes. Which really are like the old, the old, uh, it's, it's an old uh, system, but uh, they put them underwater. Exactly and, like and that. That's smart. That's smart. I mean, that that might work. Right, and so uh, you don't interrupt the uh, the fish populations. You you basically uh, use what we call run of river mm -hmm. uh, power, and it's it's not useful on a really wide basis. But for communities that live near these rivers, and you can offset uh, long lines that come in from grid-based power, very attractive. Therefore, we may have a green future after all. To sum it up. We're certainly going to have something that's a, a green possibilities future if we start to take advantage of it. We've got the tools, uh, we've certainly got the ideas, and it, what we need is a policy system, work with the regulator to start implementing it, making some of the incentives to, available to make it happen. Well, Professor Moore, we'll, uh, we'll wait for that and then we'll talk about it.
Excellent. Thank you. Thank you. Michael Moore was our guest this week on the Energy Series of The World Show. I'm Bob Scully. Have a great week. Thanks. <music>